Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me today on Jay Slay Made in the USA, where we explore truth, expose deception, and inspire courage. Guys, about two to three months ago, around you know October and everything that went down in Israel, um, I had already been exploring the idea around political Zionism. What is it really? Um, is it just that the Jewish people, um, you know, deserve to have their own nation state and should be able to protect their borders? Or is it something more? On top of that, the idea of the rapture became very interesting to me again, because look at the times that we're living in. There's a lot of signs of the times that seem to be, if you hold to a futurist view of Revelation, these things kind of seem to be playing out with all the globalism, the mass deceptions, people falling for these mass deceptions, which seem rather obvious. So on both counts when it, when it comes to Israel or when it comes to globalism and potentially moving right into the end times, these things really matter right now. And I began to do a, a deep dive that I'd really been doing for about a year, but two months ago, I wrote an article um, talking about my own upbringing in a very, very Zionist Protestant Christian culture that supported Israel almost blindly, as well as um, the kind of the left behind mentality on the rapture and that, you know, the first thing that's going to happen is Jesus is going to appear, going to appear in the clouds secretly to the Christians that are believers currently. And then you've got a seven year tribulation. And then beyond that, man, it gets, it gets complicated. We're going to get into some of that today. The problem is there's a lot of people like me that think they're waxing eloquent, but really, you know, we're just researching on our own. We're doing the best we can. We're opening up the scriptures, but there's not a lot of academic punch maybe to what we're saying. We don't necessarily have the letters behind our names. That can be a good thing or a bad thing these days, but we need some, some people that are willing to, to step up to the plate and say, Hey, I've studied this my whole life. I've got the credibility to back up what I'm saying. And one of the people I ran into in my research uh, on YouTube mostly, was Ben Witherington III. He's a Bible scholar. He's an Amos professor of, New T uh, of the New Testament for doctoral studies at Asbury Theological Seminary, which that, man, that place got put on the map last year with the, uh, the revival that happened there. He's also an emeritus of the doctoral faculty at St. Andrews University in Scotland. Um, he's gotten a Master's of Divinity degree from the Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary and a Ph.D., from the University of Durham in England. He's considered one of the top evangelical scholars in the world and is an elected member. These are acronyms I don't know. Prestigious SNTS, a society dedicated to New Testament studies. He's taught at Ashland Theological, Vanderbilt, Duke, Gordon, Gordon Conwell. So I could go on and on and on. It's an it's a awfully long and distinguished bio. I'm honored to have you today. Professor Witherington, thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Glad to be with you. Absolutely. Well, as, as we dig into this, let's start with you. You know, like I said, that is a long bio. There's, I, you know, I read a third of it there. I could have kept going. What's day to day look like for you? I know we tried to make this happen back in December, but you were busy uh, with, with school type stuff. So what's what's work well, life look like? Well, we have 57 biblical studies PhD students in Old and New Testament. That's enough to eat my lunch every single day. <laughs> yeah. So that's a lot of work to get them to the point of being full-fledged Bible scholars, serving the church or colleges, missions, various things like that. So, you know, I teach four courses a year, two in the fall, two in the spring. About half of them are doctoral seminars for the doctoral students. Otherwise, I'm teaching master's level students. Um, and, you know, I, I do a lot of events. I do a lot of church events. I do, uh, you know, I, the Society of Biblical Literature, the SBL, I go and give lectures for them. I write for the Biblical Archaeology Review magazine. Um, I lead tours to the lands of the Bible. I'm a busy guy. Sounds like it. <laughs> and didn't you say you were just at the Bible Museum as well recently? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I give lectures to the docents. Uh, people who lead the tours um, and try to train them to have a better level of biblical literacy as they guide people through the museum of the Bible. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that as well. On top of which I've written 60 books in my life. So I, I have not 
eaten the bread of idleness during my 40 years of teaching <laughs> in the ministry. It doesn't sound like it. And speaking of books, one thing we're, we're going to bring up later today, I'll go ahead and put it on the screen. You have a recent book called Sola Scriptura. I believe that's that's the official title of it. I'm looking for the, uh, the way that's to pull right. it up right now. Tell us a little bit about that as I'm looking for the screenshot. Well, you know, one of the things that's happened in America is uh, increasing biblical illiteracy. And on top of which, the other thing that's happened is that even in contexts, Christian contexts, uh, colleges, churches, etc., the final authority of Scripture is being um, compromised or even rejected on certain issues, like the issues of human sexuality. Right. And and uh, and I'd had enough of that because, in fact, the Bible does have some very specific things to say about what is appropriate human sexual expression and what's not. Yes. What counts as marriage and what doesn't. So, you know, I, 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 what I wanted to show, which is really interesting to me, is throughout church history, there's always been, since New Testament times, uh, an affirmation by some, and in some cases many, uh, of the final authority of Scripture. Not the final authority of human experience, not the final authority of human reason, not the final authority of the church or some leader in the church like the Pope. No, the final authority of Scripture itself. It's the norm amongst norms. And what's, what was interesting to me, which shocked me, is that the people who were beating this drum before there was a Protestant Reformation were peeping like, People like Dante, who wrote the Divine Comedy, mm -hmm. uh, William of Ockham, famous philosopher in England, uh, also a Catholic, beating this drum. Various other people who are critiquing the the corruption and the papacy, uh, and so this idea of sola scriptura is not particularly a a Protestant idea. Right. Protestants were happy to wave the banner, but they were by no means the first to do so. So uh, what I'm arguing for is that. In regard to matters that scriptures teach, that is still the final authority. Okay. That's still the final authority. Yes, and there, there's the book right there. You, that's that's just the Amazon uh, little clip right there. You can go to Amazon, look up Sola Scriptura. It's the first uh, thing that comes up, and I'll put a link in the description to that as well. Um, okay, so you know, with my intro there, I talked about a few big topics. Some in the audience may know exactly what I'm talking about. Others may be like, Where, where's this going? What's this interview about? So let's start with this. I'm going to let you define some terms for everybody here. Sure. Um, here's the ones I'd like to, to, to define right out of the gate. So from a 10,000 foot level, let's talk about premillennial dispensationalism. So we don't have to get in the weeds on it, but generally speaking, how old is it and uh, what is it? Okay, so far as I can tell, as a student of church history as well as the Bible, this whole theology is a modern theology. It really didn't exist uh, before the 17th century, and it didn't become sort of a dominant theology of any kind before the 19th century, before uh, the Plymouth Brethren, before revival in Glasgow, before the, the leader of Plymouth Brethren influencing D.L. Moody, who was really the Billy Graham of his day. Uh, and then, of course, there was the Schofield Reference Bible. Right. And then also there was Dallas Theological Seminary, as well as Moody Bible Institute, and we're off to the races. And then, of course, there's popular treatments of this subject in my lifetime, The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey, Various uh, the, the Left Behind series, which may I just say to your audience now, the Left Behind series should be wait for it left behind. <laughs> hey, you know who real. else left it behind, Ben? You know who else left it behind? Kirk Cameron. Ooh. Kirk Cameron. Yeah. He just he came to my church um, a couple months ago, and he and my pastor are good friends. And behind closed doors, asked my pastor he'd be fine telling uh, me sharing this with the audience. But Kirk Cameron no longer subscribes to that belief at all. Well, praise the Lord. And, and I will tell you that some of the most adamant persons who were advocates of this theology have become 
something else. They call themselves now progressive dispensationalisms. Okay. And to those who call themselves that, I say, keep going, you're progressing. You need to progress <laughs> beyond dispensationalism. So what are we talking about? What we're talking about is two second comings. Two, an invisible coming of Christ to rapture the saints out of a big old tribulation mess or just before a big old tribulation mess into heaven so that they don't have to suffer, bless their hearts. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, this theology is something the church never affirmed. Uh, from the first century on, uh, the, the battle cry was, be prepared to suffer and if necessary, even be martyred. And you can't be any more dead than dead. Right. So why exactly? should the supposed last generation of Christians be exempt from such suffering or martyrdom? Answer, they shouldn't be. In fact, the book of Revelation says not get ready to rumble or get ready to be raptured. It says be prepared to suffer and die like Antipas did in the Revelation 2 and 3. I could, so, be, wrong. I could be wrong on this, but I almost feel as well that, that modern day Christians, like I'm not talking about every person, because there, there's some really wonderful people that are close to the heart of God, no doubt about it, that are willing to suffer. But it almost seems like we are less worthy than the the, the early church and other uh, times throughout history where, you know, like now, like if, if anybody deserves to go through tribulation, it might be us. Well, yeah. Um, the, the funny thing to me is, I mean, I've, I've been teaching my Sunday school class here in Lexington, Kentucky, the book of Revelation. They wanted to hear it. They wanted to hear it. I said, this is the most complex piece of literature in the whole Bible. Let's not start there. They said, it's time for Revelation. I uh -huh. said, okay, and please don't call it Revelations plural. Anybody that starts a sentence like that doesn't know what the book of Revelation is. It's <laughs> the revelation of John the divine. And so, you know, we've been studying this and studying this, and I tried to explain to them that the various places, for example, in the book of Revelation, where John says, and I was on the spirit, in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard somebody say, and I saw, come up here. Now, this is a visionary experience. This is not him flying air ruach into heaven. He's on the island of Patmos. He's in exile. He's not leaving planet Earth. He's having a visionary experience where he sees things that are going on in heaven. That's all. There's absolutely no rapture theology in the book of Revelation at all. None. Uh, and and what, it, what is said, however, <clears throat> is that even if Christians physically suffer or even have to die, they will be spiritually protected through the suffering, through the suffering. Right. Not, not exempt from the suffering, not beamed up from the suffering, through the suffering. Um, and so we've had to talk about that. We've had to talk about Matthew 24. Jesus draws an analogy between what happened in the days of Noah and what's happening uh, w when, in fact, we have this big kaboom later. And what he says is it will be as it was in the days of Noah. Now, let's think about that for a minute. Remember mm -hmm. these little sayings? Two grinding at the mill, one is taken, the other left behind. I sing a solo at church about it. You know, one man walking up a hill. <laughs> well, yeah. guess what? Guess what? It's good to be left behind because the ones that are taken away are taken away for judgment. This is exactly the story of Noah. Noah and his family are going, we were left behind. Thanks be to God. Yeah. It, it's those who are taken away that are being judged. It's not those left behind. So this whole idea that there's a theology of you want to be out of here when let's get ready to rumble happens is simply not good biblical theology at all. And even in 1 Thessalonians 4, where we will meet the Lord in the air. The dead in Christ will be raised and we'll meet the Lord in the air. Air, sky, is not heaven. And in fact, that whole story is set up like we're going out to meet a king and welcome him back to earth. Right. There are not two sets of passages about Christ coming. There's one set, the visible, noisy, loud second coming. And when that happens, the dead in Christ will be raised. We will go to greet him and meet him in the air and come back to rule with him on the earth. There is 
no pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation rapture theology in the Bible. That is a modern theology imposed on the scriptures. And it's not what the first through 19th century Christians believed. And frankly, worldwide, it's also not what most Christians, the billions of Christians in the world, believe today. That's very interesting. And you're hitting on something that really helped me turn the corner. So the thing that was most upsetting to me, and honestly, it was upsetting as I began to interview, not, not necessarily people with your academic background, but pastors or missionaries or others that, that weren't, you know, necessarily from the Southern Baptist uh, group or whatever, I would ask them questions about their end times theology, but I would do it on the air and I would notice they'd kind of skirt the question. And then later on, they would bring up to me, they'd say, you know, I really didn't want to talk about where I really stand because I might get some backlash from my publisher or from my uh, denominational backers or what have you. And, but they would tell me, they'd be like, I, I don't necessarily, I used to hold to the rapture theology. I don't necessarily anymore. And I'd say, why? And they would say, well, uh, well, many of them would say, because as I research where that came from, and I realized it was only a couple of hundred years old, um, a lot of them would point back to Darby. You alluded to, to even in the 17th century, there were a few small groups that were kind of like toying with the idea. Yeah. Um, I didn't believe, I didn't want to believe that. So I chose not to look at it. And then I began to do some research about a year ago and realized like, this is true, that, that this is a very recent phenomena within the church. But Ben, I want to ask you a question about that. Can you prove that? You know, going back prior to, let's say prior to Darby, prior yep. to Darby, yep. wh where was this theology? How did it come about? Well, let's, let's start with the beginning, a very good place to start. Um, like Genesis one or what, which beginning? Oh, well, let's just start with the gospel, with the okay. coming of the kingdom of God in the ministry of Jesus. The end times began, the eschatological end times began with the ministry of Jesus. We're, we're not looking forward to the end times in the future. There's only the end of the end times that we're awaiting. Okay. We've been in the end times for over 2000 years, frankly. That's the real truth of the matter, okay? So we've been in this eschatological age, and in every age of church history, there have been wars and rumors of wars and True. false prophets and false messiahs and plagues and on and on and on. All of those things that Jesus warned about have been characteristic of every age of church history, all of them, including now. Look at Israel, look at Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. This is the, we have been in the end times for a very long time. And in regard to the end of the end times, Jesus says of that day or hour, nobody knows. How do you define the end of the end times? Because the return of Christ and the resurrection of the dead. So you don't so, feel like there's going to be a progression of um, the, the wars, the rumors of wars, people, people would say now that, that don't hold to your position. Well, look around, it's getting worse. I mean, I even mentioned in the intro to this show, it seems to be this globalism is at a level that we've never had it. And that does tend to be a, a, a biblical revelatory idea. Well, uh, let me remind you that at the end of world war two, we discovered that the Nazis had killed 6 million Jews in concentration camps. And World War II was widely viewed as we are at the end of the end times. In, 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 pa in pastoral circles, were they saying that? Absolutely. All over the country. Uh, indeed. Adolf Hitler is number 666. No question. And you know what? That was also true during World War I. It was also true during the Civil War. We could just keep going. So, no, I don't think we're in any better or worse condition than we were before, you know. And then, of course, there was Oppenheimer. We went and obliterated two whole cities of Japan. Right. You know, if, if that didn't wake up the apocalyptic clock, nothing will. So, really and truly, there is, first of all, it will happen. Christ will return in God's timing. Jesus is very clear that of the day or the hour or the timing in general, that of the second coming, nobody knows, not even the angels in heaven know. It even says in Mark 13, 32, not even the son knows, only the father knows, and he's not telling. 
Right. So right. all of these prognostic. Here's the thing: the prognostications of how close we are to the end and when Jesus is coming back have had a thousand percent failure rate. That's right. You know, if you have a thousand percent failure rate, you just stop. You know, you 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 give up because we don't know. The first big one, the first big one that I remember, Ben, you know, I was only six, seven years old. But again, based on the uh, Protestant circles that I was in, the Southern Baptist in Tennessee, um, everybody was talking about 1988. I think there was another one in the early 90s. But I think Hal Lindsey's big prediction, he was the late great planet Earth guy and people like um, uh, now I can't think of his name. uh, Jimmy Evans, the tipping point. If you read the beginning of his tipping point book which is all about the rapture and all about end times. He's like my, my mentor and hero in all of this is Hal Lindsey. And, uh, you know, he had, he had said 88 and then 88 came and went. And I remember again, I'm six, seven years old, but I remember it, ca- it happened again in the nineties then happened again with Y2K and like, it just kind of keeps going. And it's almost, it's almost like a cottage industry. Well, well it is. And it sells a lot of books. Well, and- yeah. Let me explain to you one of the fundamental things that's wrong with this whole theology. It's escapist. It's escapist theology. It's a beam me up Scotty theology. We don't want to have to be responsible for doing good works in the earth. We don't want to have to be involved in creation care. Heavens, no, it doesn't matter. The world's going to you know, blow up or burn up. We don't care. Uh, you know, it's, it's not the theology of the New Testament. It just isn't. It's a very escapist theology. And I would just remind people that the the talking about dying and going to heaven anyway is a minority theology in the New Testament. The primary theology is Christ will return, the dead in Christ will be raised, etc. In other words, the final future we're looking for is not somewhere out there. The final future is right here on earth when Christ returns and the new creation happens. We do not need an escapist theology. Tell you a quick funny story. Yeah. So there's a Baptist college, which shall not be named, in Texas that invited me to come and give my two lectures on dispensing with dispensationalism. Okay. Now, this school had in its faith statement dispensationalism. So I already found this a very peculiar request but I was happy to do it, you know? So I go and give these lectures. People ask lots of good questions. They were very polite, etc. And then, you know, I began to ask the faculty, well, why, since this is part of your faith statement, did you invite me to do this? And you didn't sort of set me up to have somebody ride in on a white horse and refute what I was saying. And they said, well, two reasons. We wanted the students to hear another point of view. But frankly, many of those on the faculty don't believe in the rapture theology anymore. Hmm. And I went, shazam, (laughs) this is Texas. Are you kidding me? You know, so what they wanted, because they didn't have the courage of their convictions, is they wanted the Lone Ranger to ride into town, fire the silver bullets, influence the students to rethink this whole thing, and then leave. And they could, they had, they had plausible deniability because they'd say, well, that's just Ben. And besides, he's a Methodist, he's not a Baptist. So bless his heart, he's wrong. Yeah. You know, w- what I found really odd about that whole situation was there's an awful lot of serious and quite rightly doubt about that theology because it keeps not coming true. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I remember watching Pat Roberts in 1999 having one of these prognosticators on all about Y2K and Jesus will come back exactly in 2000 AD because it's exactly 2000 years after his birth. And I just laughed and laughed and laughed. And like, where's said, that in the Bible? <laughs> Jesus was born somewhere between two and six BC. He should have already come before this program aired in 1999, if that was true. We don't know. And here's the real big problem with this. Pro, pro, you know, prophesying when the second coming's coming is an attempt for humans to get hold of the timetable. God is not letting go of the timetable. It's in God's good time. We don't know when it's going to be. 
what we know is the fact of the return of Christ, the resurrection of the dead, final judgment, new creation. We don't know, and we're not supposed to know the timing. So it, you can look at the world and wring your hands all you want until you actually hear the trumpet blast and Jesus coming down from heaven. Just live your life as if each day might be the last, but there may be many more days. And don't waste your time trying to draw up charts about the end times. That's a good point. Um, let me ask you real quick. I'm, I've put together just a real brief timeline, and I want to hear where I'm in error if this is generally right. Again, this is just 10,000 okay. foot level. So you've got in the 1820s, um, Edward Irving, and you've got Margaret MacDonald, and then Dar uh, John Darby took hold of that and yep. brought it over to the United States. He was a, he was a Scottish uh, Plymouth Brethren pastor, um, brought it over to the States, and then you had uh, the Moody Bible Institute and the colleges get a hold of it. The, the Dallas Theological School got a hold of this theology. It kind of surrounded the, the the whole nation at that point. Then you had pop culture really get on board with Late Great Planet Earth and the Left Behind series. Is that generally right? That, or am I that's fairly right. But the big disseminator of this theology was the Schofield Reference Bible. Did I miss that? Yes, you did. Oh, yeah. I had it in there. I just didn't read it. Yes. Tell me about that, that piece of it well, from Darby Schofield, to Schofield. Schofield was a rascal. He ended up in jail, abandoning his wife, stealing money, etc. But the Schofield Reference Bible was the, the best-selling Bible uh, when it came out for many, many decades. And here's the worst part of this. The whole dispensational schema was implanted into the text of the Bible. For example, you would have a heading in Matthew 24 that says, Jesus predicts the rapture. I got news for you. In the original who, who, who wrote that? Darby? I mean, I'm sorry, did Schofield, Schofield wrote those headings? Schofield did it. It was Schofield who did this, right? Who was and, telling him to do that? Surely he didn't come up with it on his own. No, no, he did not. There were others thinking about, I mean, understand there was a huge crisis after the Civil War. There was Reconstruction. There was poverty. I mean, that war killed more Americans than all the rest of the war since then combined. We lost more citizens in the Civil War than in World War I, II, Korean War, Vietnam War, you name it. Okay? Hmm. It was wow. a huge cultural problem. Right. And, and Schofield was offering them a way out of poverty, a way out of alcoholism, a way out of all kinds of stuff uh, by the way it's framed. And here's the real bad part, Jeremy. The, the original dispensational schema involving the Old Testament as well as the New Testament didn't involve studying the Hebrew text. It didn't involve studying the Greek text. It involved putting pieces together from the King James Bible, which is a translation. And as you know, every translation is already an interpretation. Right. And the King James Bible is today by no means the best translation you could use to study these matters. And so we were off to the races. Now, ordinary Joe Lay or Betty Layperson are not going to know that the Schofield Reference Bible is guiding him in the direction of dispensationalism. The headings are right there. I mean, I, I was a pastor of four Methodist churches when I came back from my doctoral work in North Carolina. And one day I went to visit a little old lady. She had a gigantic family Bible, King James, of course, mm -hmm. an old one, and opened the front cover. And right there it says King James Bible. And I said, ma'am, you do realize that King James didn't write this Bible. She says, says on the front page, King James Bible. Well, of, said, co of course the king took, it, took time out of his schedule to write that Bible. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm going, you know, Here's the problem. Sometimes you're going to confront, confront adamant, invincible ignorance. What are you going to do with that? You're just going to have to pray that the grace of God hits them at some point and they learn how to listen to the truth about these scriptures for sure. Then, you know, I, I recently got a King James Bible, and in the beginning, now maybe this isn't in all of the Bibles, but there's a letter written to King James about how they hope that it's worthy of the times they hope that that he'll accept it 
Um, you know, I, I, but is that not in all of the King James Bible Bibles? No, it, it, it's not. But but here's the other part about this: King James is um, dictates to the Oxford and Cambridge teams that we're going to do the Bible, where don't do anything new, just follow Coverdale Bible, the Geneva Bible, uh, William Tyndale, John Wycliffe, previous attempts <clears throat> at translating into English, and just. Uh, give them, give us the greatest hits of those previous English translations. It is not even an original translation of the Greek and Hebrew text. It is a recapitulation of previous English translations of the Bible. The King James Bible didn't drop from the sky like the Book of Mormon is claimed to have done uh, and be uncovered. It was attempted to standardize to have one English translation for everybody that everybody would love. And to me, one of the most interesting things you can do is read the original 1609 King James and compare it to William Tyndale's translation. Guess what? Shazam. All those most familiar idioms and phrases were in Tyndale before they were even in King James Bible Hmm. by a hundred or more years. I mean, for example, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Yeah, that's not King James Bible. That's Tyndale. Uh, we escape by the skin of our teeth. That's Tyndale. Am I my brother's keeper? That's Tyndale. We could go on and on and on about this. And the, so, g- generally, though, whether it's King James or Ten, uh, Tyndale, is it reflecting the original um, context and the original uh, author's intention? Those phrases. Well, uh, here's what. Yes, those okay. itty phrases. Those particular phrases. Yes, but here's the thing. You're only as good as the original manuscripts you have in front of you that you're translating from. Right. In the time of the King James, they had like four or five medieval Hebrew texts of the Old Testament and Greek manuscripts that were no earlier than like the 7th century A.D. Today, we have 5,450 manuscripts, part or whole, of the Greek New Testament some of which go back to the 2nd century A.D. Wouldn't it be better if we got back to the original inspired text? Well, that's what translators are trying to do today, whether it's the NIV or some of these other translations. That's what they're trying to do. The truth of the matter is that modern translations done in the 20th and into the 21st century are far more accurate than the King James was. And why? Because they're closer to the original text. That's why. Okay, that's good. Good to know. I'm I'm on a journey of understanding the whole translation game, and and you know which Bible am I going to use? Typically, uh, I'm getting deeper in that myself, so I appreciate that. Let's let's switch gears for a second. I mentioned the name Edward Irving, and and then obviously John Darby. I think those guys were rubbing elbows quite a bit at the time, uh, back in the 20s and 30s. Um, I'm going to say some things that I think I know, Ben. You can correct me, and then sure. I've got some questions about it. So. As I'm reading Edward Irving's work, and he, he, he fell in love with the idea of, of the rapture of, a, a, of two second comings of Christ. He also right. fell in love with the idea of the modern nation of Israel coming back together um, and, and God almost like almost kind of like a renewing of his vows to, to ancient Israelites and like, okay, the covenant was never broken, etc. Darby, in a sense, fell in love with the same two ideas. And then that that came to America. Am I am I generally right so far? Well, so far so good. Okay. But the question is, what was Israel supposed to look like when the diaspora was over and Jews returned to the Holy Land? I, I want to. And in what way were they supposed to reform themselves? Right? Were they supposed to set up a secular democracy? No, they were not. In fact, they were supposed to have a king, i.e., the Messiah. Right now, if you go to Jerusalem today and go to the Wailing Wall and you run into the ultra Orthodox that are praying at the Wailing Wall on Shabbat on right. Friday night, you know what they're praying? You know what they're singing? We want Messiah. We want Messiah now because they know that the current state of Israel is not biblical Israel. It's not biblical Israel. The Orthodox and the ultra Orthodox are waiting for the Messiah to show up. And when that happens, then they hope they will have the king that they need 
and they will recover the land and etc. Now, if that's what you mean by Zionism, fine. But what we have right now with Israel and Netanyahu and all this sort of stuff is not biblical Israel, period. Yes. There's a, and, and, and to my mind, and I'm still exploring these issues, my next few articles are going to be about this, but there's a deeper subversive thing going on here. I, you know, I've mentioned the, the 20s and the 30s. At that same time was when I found four separate historical articles from, from the U.S., that uh, newspaper articles that talked about the Rothschilds at that time by land in Jerusalem and a good amount of land. Now that's not, they, they didn't have the deed title right there in the newspaper, but they were talking about this happening as a historical yeah. event Four right. separate articles. It's that right. same time period. And then when, um, uh, Ed, Edward Irving, as well as the Schofield Bible later on, but when Ed, Edward Irving translated the coming of Messiah and glory and majesty by this Jesuit who was pretending to be a Jew, it happened at the Oxford University Press, which at that time, maybe still today, was owned by the Rothschilds. So I'm not looking to get into this big conspiratorial thing with you here, but I am saying strange that that time period would have that that family driving forward this this idea of Zionism that I think you're talking about, which is a geopolitical move. Mm -hmm. Well, see, let, let's think about this for a minute. In fact, if you look at what happened leading up to World War II and after World War II, you have famous Jews who don't agree with Nazism. Uh, the good examples would be, for example, Sigmund Freud, who fled to Vienna, the famous psychologist. Right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, you have <clears throat> Karl Barth. Who fled to? Uh, who had a Jewish background? Who who fled to Switzerland? Did you say uh, Karl Barth? Barth, yes. Barth was it? Was was, was that um, what's his name? The famous um, theologian. Uh, we talk. Eric Metaxas wrote a book on him, but he was like his mentor. Oh yes, absolutely. You have Einstein. Einstein, definitely a Jew. Yeah. You have an op Oppenheimer, also a Jew. You have uh, the man who came and started the uh, NASA program, I, whose name escapes me at this minute. But in any case, you had Jews who really realized that history was not inevitably going to produce biblical Israel. And, and they were afraid, in fact, that Jews were more in danger of being exterminated, not supported. And in fact, six million Jews in the Holocaust, the Shoah, as Jews call it, were killed in Nazi concentration camps. People, they were, the Nazis were trying to exterminate right. Judaism, right? Now, here's the thing. At the time that that was going on, you have still Britain running Palestine, and they call it Palestine, okay? Europe in their collective guilt for what happened to Jews in Europe right. during World War II, said, we need to set up, help set up a secular Israeli state. That's what we need to do. 1948, you have David Ben-Gurion, you have Golda Meir, and others, none of whom are Orthodox Jews. They're secular Jews, and they are more influenced by the teachings of Karl Marx. I'll give you one example. All these kibbutzes that you still have in Israel, guess where that idea comes from? It doesn't come from the Old Testament. It comes from Karl Marx. Hmm. We should share all our goods in a community and live right. together, right? So 1948 is not a fulfillment of prophecy of we now have biblical Israel. It's not. It never was. And so, you know, what we're dealing with here is a mythology called Zionism. That's what we're talking about. Now, do I believe that Israelis, Jews, have a right to be in the Holy Land? Of course I do. The Old Testament says so, and I, I believe they have a right to be there. But how are they supposed to t treat the stranger in the land, whoever is a non-Jew living there? Well, that's not what's happening right now in Gaza, right? That's not what's happening. 
Tell, so, g- give give me your just real quick side note. You know, there's a lot going on right now uh, over there. Um, what is the lay of the land over there right now from from your perspective? And to, I mean, we know what happened on October seventh, but since that time, what's what's it looked like? Well, first of all, Hamas is a terrorist organization. The the leadership of Hamas, the political and military leadership of Hamas, clearly a terrorist organization like ISIS, like Hezbollah. Okay, <clears throat> right. Nobody should be happy about them. Okay, but they are basically cowards. They hide behind innocent men, women, children. They built tunnels under Gaza to to uh, under. They hide in hospitals, that sort of thing. Nobody should like them. But on at the same time, the Israeli response is out of all proportion to what a targeted attack on Hamas should have been. There are thousands and thousands of Palestinians that have now been killed. I heard 24,000 recently. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I was in D.C. this past week. There were a, close to 100,000 Palestinians protesting next to the White House, and, and rightly so, because what's going on is the genocide of Palestinians. Now, two wrongs don't make a right. Hamas was wrong. This kind of huge, heavy-footed response to Hamas is yeah. also wrong. It's not humane. It's not Old Testamental. It's wrong. It's murder is what it is. I've, you don't have to answer what I'm about to say, but I have looked from the year 2000, 2001 until today on you've got terrorists that attack Israel from time to time. They take a few lives or in the case of October 7, a lot. And the retribution every time is at least four times or more against, you know, the, the Palestinian people. Uh, and that they'll say, well, it's it's so that we we can we got to be able to defend ourselves. Right. But every time the the uh, encroachment of Israel's territory versus the Palestinian territory, it, it, it always goes against uh, Palestine every single time. And I feel like the Christian response is very Old Testament in the sense of like where, where God said, hey, go in and, and kill every man, woman and child. And because now we believe, well, they're God's chosen people. It's almost like we look the other way and we say, you know, because yeah. they're God's chosen, they've got a mandate. They can kind of do this. We're just not going to talk about it. Yeah, and the question we should have been asking if we're Christians is, is this what Jesus would do? Is this what Jesus would do to the Palestinians? Absolutely, positively, definitely not. And not least because, guess what? Many of the Palestinians are Christians. Hello? How many? Hello? What, 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 what percentage? Let's be, I want to I get some specifics when, on that statement. When I was growing up, it was 40% of the population of the West Bank and Gaza were Christians. Wow. 60% were Muslims. Now it's less than 20%. You know why? Because smart Palestinian Christians, if they were able, left. Got out of there. They, they, moved, they moved to the United States. I mean, that's why, that's why there were 100,000 Palestinians in Washington protesting all this. Not now, Ben, that all- number is going to shock a lot of people because even 20%, I would have said five. I would have said maybe 5% are actually... Mm-hmm would call themselves Christian. You're telling me that even now, 20% of the Palestinian people, you're not talking about missionaries, you're talking about people that live there. Well, that's the most recent statistics I've seen. And see, I'm talking about Palestinian Roman Catholics, Palestinian Orthodox, and Palestinian Protestants. I mean, I have trained Palestinians at Asbury Seminary who are pastoring in places like Nazareth. Nabil Samara was one of my students. I uh, and it, you know, I mean, this is a huge tragedy. Uh, I may have, you know, it may be it's somewhat less than twenty percent now. I think it's continuing to decrease. To be honest, well, yeah, because they're caught between a rock and a hard place. They're hard, caught between the Israelis and the the Palestinian Muslims. Well, that's, if you're not alive, you can't really have much of a witness. So <laughs> that's right. But but let me just say to you. To this day, Bethlehem and the citizens of Bethlehem are majority Christian. The mayor of Bethlehem in modern times since 1948 has never been anything but a Christian. I don't think most people know this. So do this because I think a lot of people are going to hold 
the first thing we talked about, premillennial dispensationalism as it pertains to the rapture, they'll hold that in one hand and say, that's an important view that I hold. The same people will say, well, their, their, their support of the modern day geopolitical Israel is a separate issue that they hold. They don't understand maybe the historical link there. Can you flesh that out for, for me and for the audience? Well, let's, let's be straight up about this. Um, is there in the New Testament evidence that there's a future for Israel? Paul, in Romans 11, says that when Christ returns, okay, when Christ returns, after the full number of Gentiles have been saved, a very large number of Israelites, even all Israel, will be saved by the return of Christ. Okay? So, yes, there's a future for Israelites in Christ. It's not a separate future. And this is another part of this. Salvation is not a two-track model. Salvation is not, over here the Jews are saved through keeping the Mosaic Covenant, whereas over here the Gentiles are saved by following Jesus. Right. No. Yeah, and Paul, even... Paul is very clear. Uh, the people of God are Jew and Gentile united in Christ now and in the future. And in the future. Yeah, it's not a casting off of the Jews. And that that's the way that I've, as I've come to consciousness about what's really going on in this issue and the way that, that American Christians many times view it, I'll hear pastors, even my own, say, God, God did not say that he was done. He did not cast off the Jews after Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking, no, nobody made that claim in, in Christianity. I think, if anything, yeah. the veil was torn within the temple saying, now all of us, now, now, now the Gentiles have access to what the Jews always had access to, but it's right. going to be through the person of Jesus Christ. Exactly. That's okay. exactly right. That's exactly what the New Testament says again and again and again. Absolutely. That's right. So some um, of the, some of the most respected, I mean, they're, Polish and being well spoken and having a big stage, that's one thing. And that could almost be that could be a problem. But really, guys that I, I respect, I brought up the name Jack Hibbs earlier. I'm not looking to trash the guy because I love a lot of his teaching. Um, I could name many pastors the same way. I mean, here here locally, I've got Alan Jackson at World Outreach Church. Love the man's teaching and worldview and Christian faith in a big way. But when it comes to this issue of 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 Israel, it's very just, I'm, I'm all in with support because that's what God tells me to do. However, what you're saying, Ben, I mean, you, you know, you, you've got the credentials and the academic standing to, to back yourself up on this. Like, why are they, are they just choosing not to see what you're seeing? I don't understand it. Well, I, I think part of it is when you embrace a particular ideology with both hands, right? And you think you found how to connect A to B, the Bible to Zionism, or the Bible to dispensationalism. And then when you find a way to connect A and B to C, and you think it's all in the Bible, well, then you're off to the races, in fact. And in fact, there are, are deep problems with not only with dispensationalism, but also with that kind of blind Zionism as well. And, and Yes. I mean, I grew up in a, a largely Jewish neighborhood in High Point, North Carolina. Huh. Many of my friends are Jews, okay? I love them. Jesus loves them. But but the thing about all of that is that you know, most of my Jewish friends do not love at all what's going on in Israel right now. Mm. Even the devout ones, they, they, they think Netanyahu is number 666. They think it's terrible. And see... Christians are naive about all of this. Yeah. They think if they support the government of Israel obliterating Palestinians, well, this is just part of God's plan. And no, it's not. Yeah. No, it's not. Do you think that as Christians, I, I, I know, <laughs> I, I assume that you would tell us as Christians, we need to take all of the Bible seriously, right? Absolutely. Okay. From couple to cover. Absolutely. Good. Okay. We're, but, we're... but you have to do critical thinking, right? You, you have to do critical thinking about it and understand that the Mosaic Covenant was one thing. Paul, in fact, says the Mosaic Covenant was like a pedagogos. This is Galatians 4. That is, it was a 
overseer of God's people until the time of Christ. Now, the covenant that God wants to be shared by, with the world is the new covenant with everybody. Yeah. Are we, are we getting ourselves in a, in a bind by not paying attention? Again, I'm not going to shy away from this because Jesus said it. Billy Graham has talked about it to Richard Nixon. Other, you know, it, it's in the Bible. There is a difference that, that the Lord chose to make when he said, not all Israel's faithful Israel. That's one thing. And then also in Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9, he was saying there, there are those that say they are, they are Jews, but they are not Jews. So anything I say right now can't be anti-Semitic because I'm not talking about actual Jewish people. I was only taught growing up about the, 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 the verses in Genesis and the early Old Testament about God's covenant to the Jewish people and that, you know, those who bless Israel, I will bless those who curse, I will curse. And it was like, that was it. I didn't even know about Revelation 2, 9 or any of these other things that are in the Bible until recently. Why is there such a, um, an uneven weighing of the scales in this? Well, because it's easier. <laughs> it, okay. It's easier. Don't confuse me with the facts. I know what I know. And, and here's a mind blowing one. Let's think about Abraham for a minute. Where did Abraham come from? He came Ur. from Ur of the Chaldees. You said, see, I learned something. You said Ur, not Ur. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. To, to Ur is human, but Ur is a play. Okay. Yeah, I didn't go to seminary. Uh, he, he, that's okay. He, he came from Ur of the Chaldees. And what was the religion of him and his family? They were worshiping a god called Sin, S-I-N, believe it or not. They were mm. pagans. They were Gentiles. Are you with me? You, you're not they speaking in jest right now. The me. God that they worship was actually called sin? Yes, that's right. I didn't know that. Wow. No, it's okay. But in any case, here's the thing. God had to reach out to Abraham and change his name. And Abraham trusted God. And at that point, it was credited to him as righteousness. Right. Okay. This is the beginning of the Hebrew people. And by the way, they are Hebrews long before they were Israelites because that has to do with a place, Israel. Right. Right. So there's Hebrews, then there's Israelites, then there's Jews, both in the Holy Land and outside the Holy Land. So they've had three names, Hebrews, Israelites, Jews. I can hear people saying, though, no, he's wrong. It's not about a place. It was someone's name. It was the, it was the new name. Hey. That's right. But what was the promise given to Jacob? The land. There's a place for you. And you're going to have this. It's going to have the same name as you. Right. Right. That, OK. So that's the deal there. That makes so, sense. So um, uh, we need to understand that God from the beginning was interested in saving not just Jews. But Gentiles all the way back to Abraham. Right. And so. It's not a shock when Jesus comes along and says, you know, at that messianic banquet that's going to come eventually, you know, who's going to sit down at table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? Guess who's going to sit down at table with them? Gentiles. Yeah. Coming from the east and the west. The vision was always of salvation of all the fallen human race. That was always true. That's why the Gospel of John says God so loved the world. It's the world that God loves, not just a particular people or two particular peoples. The world. That's why he sent Christ into the world, to save the world. You know, not just the frozen chosen or the elect. The world. We Christ could... died for the sins of the world. Wait for it. The world. <laughs> Yes. And with you saying that, I'm reminded of some of your videos about Calvinism versus Arminianism. But what, that could be another that could be a part two, because I'd love to dig into some of that. I want to ask you before we go here, probably the most important question in all of this. So I think that these issues matter, but I, I, I don't know how important they are in terms of at the end of the day, what what consequences befall us if we are if we are getting it wrong? on the rapture and Zionism and all of those things, but we're getting it right on. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. He saved me from my sins. I, I expect 
um, whether it's to be on a, a, you know, a new earth or in heaven. Like if I get all the, this stuff we've talked about wrong today, but I'm right on Jesus Christ and his atonement for me, does it matter? It certainly does matter if you care about being faithful to what the scriptures actually teach. In other words, you cannot truncate the theology of the Bible down to just soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. Okay. This is a huge mistake. There's a doctrine of creation. There's a doctrine of sanctification. There's, I could go on and on. There are a lot of crucial doctrines in Scripture. And if you truncate everything down to, well, I'm saved and that's all that matters, well, then what have you done? You've forgotten that the future is bright as the promises of God. And God has a future in mind for the earth and for the resurrection of the dead and for the return of Christ and for a new creation. Now, why would, you, why would God want to exchange all of that for a few scrawny souls in heaven? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Really? <laughs> no, that's not the witness of the scripture. Read the end of the Bible. Right. No, that's good. That's good. Have you had major uh, pushback in any way based on the positions that you hold in America? Well, sure. Uh, individuals. Yes, individuals. I, I haven't really had pushback in the in the guild of biblical scholars. Not really. You know, that's almost surprising to me just but maybe it's the area of the country I'm in. But we, we are overwhelmed. I mean, you would think based on the messages, you know, preached from from different major churches around here, that there must be a Hamas supporter like in every aisle of the pews, and we got to get them straight. <laughs> and in reality, like there's nobody around that's supporting Hamas. Um, but man, it, it sure is a the political geopolitical Zionism is a big deal around here. Where was I going with all that? I was going to ask you. Where, so, where, so it surprises me. I mean, where in the world are you? I'm I'm in Franklin, Tennessee, but even down, you know, when I was in Atlanta and. Just being in the South in Protestant Christianity, especially with a Baptist background, it's major. It is major. Oh, I understand. I grew up in the buckle of the Bible Belt, namely North Carolina, God's southern part of heaven. You know, that, but that, in a that, Jewish community, that's that I, that surprised me. Well, no, it's just that there were lots of Jews in High Point, North Carolina, and okay. they were my friends. I would go to bar mitzvahs and bas mitzvahs. These were my friends on the same block I lived on. And they were very good friends. And and I'll tell you an interesting story about this just briefly. Sure, please. One of my friends was named Cheryl Robinson. They had changed their name from Rabinowitz, so it didn't seem obvious that they'd be a target as Jews, right? And uh, we were seniors in high school, High Point Central High School. And she came to me one day and said, Ben, I have a favor to ask. And I said, sure, Cheryl. We've been friends for many, many years. And she said, would you take me to the prom at the country club? And I said, sure. She said, here's what you need to know. No Jew is allowed into the country club. They're banned from the country club. Banned from the country club, hmm. right? And I began to see the world as she saw it. In other words, there was an awful lot of anti-Semitism in white America, and there still is. You know, and and one of the things I'd say I'd like you to think about is Zionism is a colossal overreaction to anti-Semitism that was very prevalent in white South, in the white South and elsewhere and elsewhere. And it still is. It still is. I just so, I, I'm, in, I'm in I'm in the what would be considered the white South, 85 percent white people in Franklin, Tennessee. I'm yet to meet someone that would speak out anything against Jewish people yet to. Well, that's good. That's good. That's a sea change because I used to hear it all the time growing up in High Point. North ba based in what, though? Where, where was that sentiment coming from? Well, that they are they were God's first chosen people and they're not anymore. Ah. Among other things, you okay. know. Anyway, Cheryl and I went had a big time, danced a night away at the country club and nobody threw us in jail. But but just being able to look at life through the eyes of a Jewish friend that really opened my eyes to what happens when you're a, a tiny minority or a small minority in a country where there's rampant prejudice against all kinds of people, against blacks, against Jews, et cetera. You know, 
There's no place for any of those prejudices in the gospel of Jesus Christ or in the body of Christ. Thank goodness Jesus and Paul made that clear. And I would hope that we would believe that God has a plan for and cares for everyone. That's that's on the money. Um, one last thing, because we you, you close it out nicely in terms of um, the Jewish people, Zionism. What about on the other side? Somebody that's you know, you've kind of maybe cracked open a door a little more for them because they've always believed in the rapture. They've looked upon it with hope. Um, now that might be kind of like off the table to some degree. And as they, they go down that road, there, there might even be like a grieving process for them with that. What would you say in response to that, to that person who's exploring that, like you said, progressing? Oh, well, I would say the early church was absolutely standing on tiptoe looking forward to and excited about the second coming of Christ from the first century on. They really, really were. But what happened, of course, is the closer you get to the Middle Ages, the more the preaching of the church focused on dying and going to heaven. That's really not the emphasis in the New Testament. I mean, the only time Paul really mentions that is when in 2 Corinthians he says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Otherwise, he's, he's all about eschatology and the return of Christ and the resurrection of the dead. We need to put the emphasis on the right syllable. <laughs> the future return of Christ is our blessed hope. That's the only time that all this mess is going to be sorted out and solved when Jesus comes back. Mm. I, I love it. That's a good way to end a very complex, deep topic that can go really deep. Any, who would you be, uh, or where would you go if you're watching this and you want more information um, on these topics in terms of either Israel, Zionism, um, or the, the rapture and end times eschatology? Wh wh where would you go? Well, I, I would recommend two of my books. Okay. Jesus, Paul, and the End of the World would be one, an university book, uh, easy enough to find readily available on Amazon. And the other would be the two chapters about dispensationalism in my The Problem of Evangelical Theology. The title of both chapters is On Dispensing with Dispensationalism. Because here's the thing, there's a much brighter, better, wholesome, truly biblical theology to be embraced about the future. Hmm. All right, excellent. Well, I'm going to put all those links in the description. Ben, once again, I really do appreciate you taking the time to come on today. I know you're a busy man doing a lot of things, and um, you're helping us all go deeper. Thank you for uh, standing up for what you know to be true. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you, Jeremy. Amen. Thank you, sir. All right. God bless. Bye-bye.